There he is. What do you say, handsome? <laughs> Steve, can you hear me okay? I think you're on. I think you got yourself muted. We are running a couple minutes behind. That's right. So we're recording here in just a couple minutes. There he is. Testies, testies. I've got two, two testies. Yep, good. We're running just a couple minutes behind, so we're going to be ready to go here in a few minutes, okay? Nice. I'll get a coffee. Beautiful. You there? Oh. Kind to check the sound. Do we have to turn on the sound here? Hang on. Was the trip down okay? Yeah, it was good. <laughs> yeah, it was all good. Yeah. Can you turn the camera down a bit, Bill? Turn the camera. Cool. Yeah, that's better. Reggie! Reggie! Hey, buddy. Living the dream. 
Yes. <laughs> he doesn't know no one, Dave. So if you're going to do any question and answer, sort of they come down and sit in this box here. There's there's still ink on that cup. The confessional. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, dude. Right. How's that? How many cases of that did you run off with whenever? Uh... I only got two cups, but in the early days, we made really good quality shit, apparently. So, uh... <laughs> we ready to go? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Oh. oh! I didn't do, oh. I didn't do anything. Wow. Wow. Step away from the electronics. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, that was a problem. So Steve, I think, I, I think Steve can you hear us? And yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay, yeah, so it's, it's on. we just went through a um, projector emergency. Yeah, ah, okay. was by which, which lost your display, but we can hear you, and you're just limited to a small screen. So feel free to take it away uh, whenever you're ready. I'll get into it. Oh, it's just Bill's getting started. Okay. Yeah, I think it just, I think it just like turned off for a second. Yeah, yeah you got to wait for a second. All right. All right. While we're waiting, uh, this is uh, this is Steve Leach. As all y'all know Steve. He's the oldest action coach. Uh, he, he says he's not the oldest one, but he's the oldest standing action coach. He actually was an employee of Action Coach, and he got kicked out and had to buy a brand. <laughs> yeah. But he's been around. He is. Uh, yeah. Brand sales strategy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good sales strategy. So while we're working on getting this thing up, it looks like it's coming in. Here, we'll let you know when to go. So you don't hit me anyway? Yeah, we can hear you. Go for it. There we go. You're you're up now. Hang on. <laughs> it's me, it's me, Steve. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to the back of the room. No longer touching anything associated with presentation. Make so. sure you should let Sean fix it in the first place. Thanks, Sean. Help sign in. You've been signed out. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. This is something here to say. I've just been signed out. Okay, from another device. Jason Berry. Uh, that looks fun. So guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to, welcome to the future from Sunday morning. The, uh, it's looking like it's clearing up a little bit by the time it gets to you guys uh, tomorrow, but uh, it's awesome to uh, jump up, uh, well, to be honest, a little bit earlier than most Sundays I get up and uh, speak with you guys. So thanks very much to Steve and you guys for having us on board. Um, today we're going to cover, just remind me, Steve, about how long have I got? Got about an hour. About an hour. All right. And then question time or an hour total? Hour total. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So, guys, today I thought I would do something uh, a little bit different. Share with you something that I don't, can't actually think I've shared with uh, anybody or any group ever. Uh, it'll either be really good or uh, really shitty. So let's see. Uh, we'll see how we'll see how it turns out. It'll, it'll be it'll polarize one way or the other. Um, so God, the, and the reason I want to tell you this is to because I do want to cover some mindset, a, a little bit about the bee. And uh, before you go, oh God, not more bee do heaven. Oh no, not more iceberg and stuff. It will be hopefully at a level that you guys uh, have not considered, not experienced, and it may just be hopefully the detail that will allow you to have your breakthroughs and enjoy uh, the life that you want to enjoy. Um, so I grew up on the west coast of, of Australia. My dad was a teacher. Mum was most of the time stay at home. Uh, she had been a nurse. Dad was a senior master at the school that I, uh, that I went to. So he was in charge of year eight, nine and, uh, and 10, what we call the middle school here. Um, so I, uh, I had a couple of years at another school, um, primary school, and then I went there. So life pretty much sucked there. To say that I was mercilessly bullied would probably be these days an understatement. In those days, I think it was just something that happened, like uh, chickens trying to uh, establish some sort of pecking order. But it wasn't real cool. Firstly, being ambidextrous, I'm uncoordinated, so I was hopeless at, uh, at any sort of team sports with the other, uh, with the other kids. 
Um, I went, uh, you know, my sight went pretty early, so I think it was in about grade six that I got glasses. And for any of that have had glasses at a young age, you know the old, woo, that's great in, uh, in primary school. Uh, so I was a bit nerdy. And when your dad's the uh, a senior master with the power to uh, cane people and discipline people and that sort of stuff, a lot of the kids from the senior schools would come and seek retribution on my little ass in the, uh, in the playground. So most of the, uh, yeah, most of my lunch times and breaks were, were spent, uh, I suppose, in reality, uh, dodging, ducking and weaving my way to the sanctuary of the library where there was some staff that could keep people that were inclined to uh, beat me up away. Um, so, and I wasn't one of the smart kids, I don't know if you guys at school, I've got a theory and maybe you can prove or disprove this, that at school you've got three groups of kids. You've got the really, really smart kids that do chemistry, physics, double maths and that sort of stuff. You've got the, uh, the kids that sort of struggle and, and sort of get by and then you've got the really, really dumb kids uh, or what the school would label dumb. I wasn't quite good enough to be a really dumb kid. Um, because what happens, of course, after school is that all of the really, really smart kids go get jobs working for all the really, really dumb kids and in their incredible businesses that they've built from nothing. Uh, the kids in the middle just go and get jobs in corporate and government and, uh, and sort of uh, go from guidepost to guidepost down the road of life. I joined the military. I was quite good at the military. Um, being ambidextrous, my brain's wired a little bit differently. Um, so I quite enjoyed the army, but after several years, I, uh, uh, operational injuries had, uh, had taken their toll and the army thought it might be a good idea for me to go to get a civilian job. We didn't have money. We didn't have inheritances, the family or anything like that. We didn't really have a, uh, we had no idea really what entrepreneurialism was. So my programming wasn't, didn't put me in a good position to become successful. Over the years, I did the army thing and then got into computer-aided design and I tended to get headhunter because I just shut up and did a good job uh, and eventually joined Brad in, in 97 and, uh, and, and most of you know the story or some semblance or version with, uh, uh, with sparkles on it from, uh, from there, but it was really, really tough. Um, it was difficult because there was no precedent. When you're the first, there isn't a precedent. There's still nobody that can tell me, hey, Leachy, here's what it's going to be like when you've been a coach for 30 years. You know, when you're the first, nobody gets to out jump the first. So it's been a, a long, difficult learning curve. Um, and I had challenges with money. I developed a, a philosophy at school that, that basically rich people were assholes. Um, simply because I correlated wealth with the kids that beat the shit out of it. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was unjustified. Um, actually, it's Ziggy Bowie, David Bowie's son was in my class. He was okay. Um, but um, I, I had a bad identity about money, particularly old money. If you'd made your own money, you're okay. But these you know, guys born with a silver spoon in their mouths, all that sort of stuff, that I think a huge part of the population, that's the philosophy that they have. The interesting thing is that now, uh, after you know, a, a career or a, good, a quarter century actually this year in, in action, um, I've become what I despise, which is interesting. I found you don't have to be <laughs> as big an asshole as you want. Um, now, I have, a, I have a one person practice for most of um, most of my career, it's been a one-person practice. Um, I did invent the firm, in a way, uh, back in 98. One of my clients who I'd worked out of their business um, said, wow, this is awesome. How can I do what you do? It's like, that's a really good question. Um, um, and hey, if that was the case, how would I make a bit of a buck out of it? So I sat down with Brad and Trevor, and we came up with the idea of the associate coach that would work under a primary coach. You could have five and um, that went extremely well. He was a great guy. He was about an hour's drive south. I did very little work with him. Um, he was off and running and, and did pretty good. And I got a, a bit of money back in those days. I think it was maybe a, a grand 1500 a month, which was good for doing nothing. 
Um, I think he had a year and a half and then he upgraded to a primary license and had that for maybe a couple of years and then uh, got very excited about one of his clients and helping them franchise and got out of action, did that, all very good and, and amicable. The, uh, the second associate that took on was a complete disaster because having been lulled into a false sense of woohoo by the first one, the, uh, I didn't exactly do my due diligence on the second and I wouldn't have been able to tell probably anyway. But back then, this was 2000 and, man, this was Phuket, the first ever global in maybe 2000. Um, only two of us were really in a position to take an associate on. He didn't have the money for a primary, so I took him on. Yeah, that was, that was painful and just sucked a lot of my productivity and, and time and emotional energy um, out of me for the, uh, I don't know, maybe the year or 18 months that, uh, that he lasted. Um, so most of the time, I've worked out that my strength is, is highly productive personal exertion income. Um, I don't think I've been out of probably that maybe the top 15 in the world ever since, uh, since records, records started. My billings, I hover between uh, high emerald and, and diamond, uh, sometimes more than, more than that. Um, but I just come down and focus on being really productive. The point that I wanted to make is that I enjoy a lifestyle that back in the school days or even my previous business days, I would have never dreamt of in a million years. We've had, uh, we, Melissa, my wife and I, we've, you know, we've had a plan. Um, this makes a crap load of money and we, you know, work hard and we invest it in property. Uh, we currently have, I think just short, sure, maybe, I don't know, I want to be honest, I think it is a numbers like eight point, maybe 8.9 million bucks worth of property, um, which gives us a net worth of, I think, 6.1. Um, and we get passive income of, uh, of around 400, you know, 380, 400,000 a year. So I don't have to work. Now, in the old brand vernacular, I don't say that to impress you, but to impress upon you. The difference, the contrast between what I was and what I have become. Um, and I want to, that I think is the most difficult journey for anyone within action that B. You can do what you need to do, um, but without the B, without your brain adjusting to accept it, either you procrastinate before doing it or you sabotage after having done it. Um, and I think that's the most difficult journey that, that I've had to have, realizing that, that money doesn't actually corrupt and I want to try and help you guys uh, on that journey today with some, with some insights. Um, are there any questions so far? I'll, I'll try and remember to shut my mouth every now and again and, and uh, so if anybody's got any questions happy to answer them so far otherwise I will rip on. No hands going up. All righty. You didn't have your hand up, did you, Jason? No, he's just getting another, another beer. Okay, that's good. So, the, uh, the flip chart that I'm going to start with is, well, the only flip chart that I'm actually going to cover today, which means we're going to get some depth on it, is basically our old friend, the potato. <laughs> We've got a bit of time. I might, no, I won't. I won't. Tell you about uh, my BFO flip chart. Remind me at the end if we got time. Okay, so the iceberg. I think this, guys, will also be very, very helpful for you in coaching your clients at a different, at a different level. So when you're coaching, you always coach, well, I coach from the top down. So it's like digging down through the, the iceberg to make changes. Um, I have seen some coaches that, that will bring on a client and they jump straight into metaphysics, you know, Deepak Chopra and, and Louise Hay and James Redfield style metaphysics and start with the B. Don't start with uh, what my suggestion would, and all of these are just suggestions. My suggestion and opinion would be tackle the B when they get to a constraint. I talk to, when I talk to my clients, I say, look, imagine yourself on a, on a horizontal archery target with rings going out. And the boundary, each ring is defined by a barrier. It's your comfort zone. The internal ring, the 9-10 ring on the target is, is bounded by a barrier of toilet paper. 
it's not that hard to get through, but you can't see through it. It's opaque. You can't quite see what's on the other side, but you know something is there. It's easy to break through that one. But the next barrier is made out of something a little bit more robust. Sticks, thorns, prickles. The one after that is barbed wire. The one after that is more difficult. And eventually you get to the point where you will hit your barrier that is, we call it Bessa block, cinder block. It's an impenetrable barrier. Now, when I do an alignment, I do, it, it's interesting. I've done workshops as well. I say, what are you comfortable with? What are you really happy with? Everyone's happy with a nice pickup truck. Everyone's happy with a nice house and green grass and happy kids. But then I put slide after slide that gets more and more and more to the point of outrageous. The Ferrari, some people are okay with a, with, a, with a Cobra or something, but when you get to the Ferrari and some people start going, oh yeah, that's a bit, I, I wouldn't have one of those. Or a super yacht, they go, yeah, I'd like, a, I'd like a modest boat, maybe a 70 footer, but something that's 300 foot long, they have trouble justifying that. The ultimate sl slide I've got is this Chinese guy who's standing there in the middle of his solid gold bathroom. He's got a solid gold toilet with a solid gold seat on it. And even I go, eh. <laughs> So there's some point where you're, oh, I'd love that, I'd love that, I'd love that. Oh, that would be horrible. And it's interesting because it's quite, it's quite, a, it's quite a, a marked, there's not much of a gray line there. So, I start at the top down when I'm coaching people. And um, at the top down, at the top, obviously, we have behavior. Now with behavior, I have one tool. There is one tool that I can use to adjust people's behavior. When you sit down with a client, some of you may have done it. Dealing with behavior is easy because you go, what do you know you should have done in your business now that you haven't, that you've been avoiding? Oh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, next week, I'm going to come back. You pick which one you're going to have done and they will do it. Now, they might have avoided that activity for years. I did a seminar once and i said um i was only speaking for five minutes it was a forum there was a dozen of us and i think i was last or second last maybe last um so i spoke for five minutes and then it was like three minutes question time and it was a breakfast there's maybe 300 people for breakfast and any questions and a lady put up her hand and said oh, i stood up and said steve how much how much self-discipline do i need to run a successful business my mouth opened, which is often the case on stage without brain quite getting there first and said, well, more than you've got. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, that was a bit harsh. And I said, but what I mean by that is, I said, put, put, your, put your hand up for me. And she did. And I said, actually, this is good for everybody. Everybody put your hands up. So everybody put their hands up. And in fact, I would ask you guys here, everybody put your hands up for me. All right, the microphone is working. Couple down the back. Who's way down the back there? Maybe it's a flower pot. Okay, everyone got your hands up, eyes I can go. Hang on, I didn't say anything. Fantastic. Now, I want you to put your hands up two inches higher. That is coaching. Next week, I'll tell you how to stand on your chairs. The week after that, how to get somebody to put their hands up on your behalf. The point is there is always a point where your self-discipline fails and that's always short of where your full potential lies. Right? This is what coaching is. Coaching is closing the gap between your, where your self-discipline fails and your full potential lies. You're going to go around with your hand up like this until somebody goes, well, what's that? You can do better than that. Oh, so I can. Anyone's had a personal fitness instructor? They make you do push-ups. Okay, how many push-ups? Ten push-ups. Eight. 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 It's like, come on, you can count, buddy. I know you can. Nine. Nine, 10, they're getting the most out of it. So the tool that I've got to adjust your behavior, because that's all that is. I made you behave differently. It wasn't earth shattering. You didn't have to learn anything new or anything like that. You just had to do what you were told under 
accountability. Accountability. That will change behavior and do it very nicely. It's very quick. It's very easy. It doesn't take a lot of skill. Accountability. Great, you committed, I'm gonna make sure you did it. Now, it's coaching for dummies, but let's face it, you have gotta start somewhere as far as getting a client to overcome inertia. Just getting them to do something different. So, accountability is quick, it's easy, it's simple. And it's up to the client. They already know what they should have been doing, but nobody held them accountable and made them do it. But it will run out. Not that it runs out, the obvious stuff runs out. The golden nuggets of accountability run out and now you need to do more sophisticated mining for the goal of success. So after, so then we have to, now we've chopped the top off the, the, uh, the, the iceberg, the potato. <laughs> I might change that perfectly. Um, what else does that look like? A tooth, upside down tooth. After behavior, we've got what? What's the next one after behavior in the iceberg? Skills. Everybody, thank you, skills. Skills. Pretty obvious. What is the tool, as accountability is the tool for behavior, what is the tool that I have in my toolkit to increase your skills? It's not a trick question. Starts with E. Education. Thank you. Education. You do what you know. So you teach people new skills and they apply them. Now this is where, look, to be honest, I think as we go down the iceberg, some of us go a little bit wrong. Wrong? Yeah, wrong. Ineffective. Education, you put it this way, you've got the old saying, give a man a fish, which do we do? Do we give a man a fish or teach a man a fish? Yeah, what's the third one that we do? What, there's a third one? Crap, I didn't know that there was a third one. Okay, give a man a fish, awesome. Teach a man to fish, great. We teach a man to learn to fish. Because if we're teaching a man to fish, all our time is spent teaching, teaching, teaching. We teach people to learn to fish. You remember, you would have played volleyball probably at, at induction training, I would have hoped that you would. Now some of the questions that we would ask as facilitators of that, what's the first question, what happened? So you say, what happened during the game? Why did it happen? Oh, okay, now I've got to think why something happened. What did you learn from what happened and how do you apply it in business? How is that a reflection of business and life? Huh, wow, huh, gee whiz. This, this is a reflection. We ask you that because we're teaching you how to learn. We're teaching you how to learn from your experience in the elevator. We're teaching you how to learn from your experience standing in the, the lunch lineup. That way you take the ultimate ownership of the things that you are learning. We spend, and hands up if your coaching sessions, by the way, are taking more than an hour. Hands up in the room. All right, we've got a couple of honest people. Excellent. Up at the back. Okay. Someone going, don't make me the designated sacrificial decoy. Please, please, don't, don't call me up. Um, that's okay. Those that are taking more than half an hour, I would wonder what you're doing. And I know that what you're doing, I'm guessing, what you're doing in the, the second half or most of your coaching session is education telling them what to do. Instead of going, you've got a problem, here's the issue, you need to go to the e -Myth Revisited, page 11, chapter nine, 
read that because that will tell you, that will teach you how to solve your problem. Come back to me with what you've learned and how you're going to apply that to change the challenge. But we get so much fulfillment from teaching that we disempower. We don't enable our clients by teaching them how to learn. If you do teach them how to learn, they'll stay with you forever. It's not like you are lessened when you say, go and read Affluence by Deepak Chopper or go and read a particular book or send them something. I've got a favourite old uh, 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 saying or old joke of, a, of the Bible salesman. And the Bible salesman was going out there. He, there was a team of them and they were going out selling Bibles to uh, the community, knocking on doors. And one was doing very well. So uh, his boss called him up afterwards and said, look, you're doing really well selling Bibles, Bob, but I'm a little surprised given your handicap. What are you saying that gets people to, to buy so many Bibles compared to your compatriots? Um, and Bob goes, well, 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 I, I, I knock on the door, door and I ring, ring the doorbell and they come to the door and I, 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 I say, hi, 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 I'm selling Bibles. Would you like to b b b b buy one or should I r r r read it to you? <laughs> and obviously immediately reach into their wallets and get out the money. You, my guess is that you are spending too much time reading the Bible to your clients, explaining the five ways when Brad's done it 40 million times, it's on a video, explaining the, all of these concepts when they're in books. You're a very expensive babysitter. And these clients want to pay for results not for fluff. Now, I know human nature, I know my own nature. As I say, I've been guilty of every coach crime many, many times in the past 25 years. I want you guys to avoid reinventing that wheel or that particular pain. So if there's a challenge, down the bottom in the focus sheet is my coach in the next session, you can help me out by, I love that being empty. I don't want anything in that because all that does is divert me divert us from the task at hand, the plan. And if there is a problem, I go, I refer them somewhere to learn how to solve the problem and then come back to me and next week we will work out where in the plan that can get fitted so that it doesn't disturb our plan. Instead of going, oh, somebody quit. Oh, great. Well, what we need to suddenly do is and divert from the plan and then divert from the other plan. They have a plan. So, skills you have education, relatively straightforward. Now it get a bit tricky. When you run out of skills, so now let's say you've, you've taught them or you've encouraged them to learn what they need to learn for a particular skill and they're still avoiding it. And accountability is not particularly working. Oh, okay. Now we're down into the realm of beliefs. Beliefs, the tool I had to adjust beliefs reflection. I was working with a coach in the UK. She was having some challenges. She was having challenges, strangely enough, getting out and starting conversations and selling. And I said, imagine, okay, you need to pick up the phone. Let's do it right now. Let's pick up the phone right now and let's ring some prospects. And I said, stop. I want you to feel the feeling that you are having now. I want you to feel and recognize that visceral reaction, emotional reaction you're having to that suggestion and the thought of having to pick up the 10 ton phone. Because she had ADD, anti-dialing disorder. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I want you to think back to the first transaction you ever had that created that feeling? And she came up with it very quickly. She'd been at a, uh, she'd been at a, um, uh, like a, 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 a fair type thing where, where people are around selling stuff and, and I'm not sure if it was a sort of boot sale type thing or a fair or whatever. Um, and people came up to her and were asking her about what they were selling and 
and she started talking to them. Um, and her dad came, dragged her off, took her out of sight, and let's call it severely reprimanded her for talking to the people. If they want something, they'll buy it. Don't talk to them, don't engage, they will just come, they'll buy, they go. You don't talk to them, you don't call them over, anything like that. So as a young you know, uh, girl, that was in profoundly embarrassing and that sort of thing. And that can set us on a path of this, oh, I've got this unconscious, I, I call my you know, stupid Steve, this is smart Steve, there's stupid Steve somewhere else. Yeah, he's the one that thinks a million bucks is a lot. He's the one that thinks I shouldn't get a supercar. He's the one that thinks I should be working harder for a living and we'll get into that. Um, so reflecting on that, wow, allowed her to start the journey to realize that the rules that created the response are not valid anymore. When I had my uh, son, my second son, first son, second child, I was giving Mitch a bath, uh, you know, a couple of inches of water, a little baby splashing around, like, come on, cut it out, Mitch, let's just get washed, get out of the bath. And then I thought to myself, wow, that's unreasonable. I haven't got anywhere to go, there's no reason for that. So I went and rang dad. And I said, dad, why wouldn't you ever let me muck around in the bath when I was like, you know, three months old? You can imagine the conversations I have occasionally with my dad, he's like, what the, well, you remember that now? <laughs> um, so we apparently grew up in an area that had no town water. So we were on tank water. We spent a fair bit of time in, uh, in drought. So there was two inches in the bath. So the babies had a bath, me, my brother, my sister, my mum, and then dad got a bath in the same two or three inches of water, just enough to sort of have a bit of a sponge bath type thing. So if it didn't happen quickly, without splashing, A, there's no heat, B, there's no water. Dirty, you can't help dirty. And so I could go, oh, wow, well, huh. That's where I got that belief, that unconscious belief from. That doesn't make sense these days, so I can abandon it. My suggestion is that you have a look back at your beliefs and where you gained your beliefs. They're very, I, I spend a significant amount of time with clients on mindset because it defines what you can do. You know, I was just reading when I came in a, a lovely forward that Bruiser did in his, in his book for me as, as his trainer and as his coach of six or seven years. You know, just saying how uh, I changed his life because of the way he thinks. You, you change who I am. My client, my client, my highest paying client, I work maybe four hours a week for them, maybe four, four and a half hours a week. There's a few people that I coach within the, the organization. They pay over 300,000 a year for me to work four hours a week for them. And I said, now stupid Steve doesn't like that by the way. <laughs> I don't get that. You know, some weeks I wake up paranoid going, wow, what if they, but they never do it. And I said, Glenn, what is it? And he said, You've, you above everyone else has helped me become who I need to become to accept this. To give you some insights, 20 years ago, he's framing in some frozen backwards. Six years ago, when I started working with him, the company was doing $6 million. We've doubled it every year. This year, we will do 100, this year we'll do $160 million. And he just bought a really nice G200 Gulfstream jet. Personally, or the, the company, not sharing it with anybody or anything. It's like, but you've got to be, have a different mindset to accept that without being embarrassed about it. So where do you get your beliefs about money? Imagine yourselves as three years old. Think back, well, as young as you can remember, or for those of you that have kids, you can see what happened to you in how you treat your kids most of the time, because life and generations are like a mirror, bloody mirrors. So the three-year-old is at the, at the table at the picnic and you bring out a plate of cookies and you offer the cookies to the, the child. How many cookies does the child take? All of them. As many as his short, chunky little fingers can take. Now, what is the reaction to that? <coughs> Put it down. Oh, greedy boy. Don't be greedy. Wait your turn. Let everybody have their fair share. 
if there's anything left, we'll come back to you and maybe you will get a cookie, which you, we all know is unlikely. At that stage of life, we're in a period called immature cognitive commitment. Our brains are hardwiring our experiences. They don't question that much about those experiences. They just hardwire and go, that is the nature of life. That is the nature of abundance. That is the nature of relationships. So we're programmed from very early on that more than our fair share or the bare minimum is selfish, greedy, thoughtless. If we're not working hard, if we're not fully engaged, if we're not participating all the time, we're taught that that's lazy and slothful and no good and irresponsible. And then we spend the rest of our lives trying to tell ourselves that we're going to work smarter, not harder. And inside of us, there's a bloke going, but if you didn't work harder, if you work less than everybody else, they'd think you're a lazy bludger. And I'll tell you, smart plus practice, sorry, hard plus practice does not equal smart. But most people think it does. So reflection will help with beliefs. But now I want to diverge a little bit. I just talked about identity. Identity is created by the time you turn three. By the time you grow kneecaps, your identity is done. Your identity is defined by your environment. Now, your environment and your identity is very, very important and it's very, very, very difficult to change. I don't even have a tool for changing identity, maybe a lobotomy. But in the middle, it brings us to this one. Values. Now, I could go through a fun time process with you that would take a little while and we would come up with some specifics, but it's beyond the scope of today's discussion. So while I'll fast track to the answer, you have one overriding value that you value above everything else. Control. Because you are alive. Everything that is alive has the highest value. They value control over everything else. Control over their situation, over their food, over their environment, over their abilities. They want control. They don't want to, yeah, I love being out of control. Even these, these, these um, uh, you know, adrenaline junkies. I love being out of control. Well, no, you don't. Oh, I'm going to go out and drive into a brick wall. Well, no, they love proving that they are in control at the boundaries of control. So they have a quest for control more than anyone else. But even a plant wants control over its environment. You know, it makes poisons to deter animals from eating it. it, it, it you know, it bullies out the other plants. So as a thing that's alive, you want control. As a sentient being, the next one is respect. You dig down, but why, but why? I want a million bucks, but why? So I can buy a boat, but why? But why, but why? It will come down to, I want to be respected. I want to show somebody that I could do what they said I couldn't do. I want to be, even people that say, oh, look, no, 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 I want to run a charity. Okay, so you're going to run that completely anonymously. Wow, like Banksy, nobody actually knows who he is. Well, no, well then you want respect. You want respect for your charitable efforts or your missionary efforts or whatever it might be. So we want control and respect. Does everybody get that? Hands up if you get that. Hands up if you think there's something else that you value in life more than, the, more than those two things. Excellent, okay. So on control and respect. So here's the crux. The crux is that this, this barrier between beliefs and values, your, ident your values need to be satisfied. So your identity determines how your beliefs satisfy your values. 
So let's consider a typical client, a business owner. How do they feel they have maintained, get and maximize control over their situation? How do they feel they get control? Let's, let's talk about your clients from the point of, you know, that, that self-employed to manager type level. How does the client think they get control of their business? Any ideas? By doing. Thank you, Martha. By doing, absolutely by doing it themselves. That's the ultimate control. I trust myself. I'm going to do it. I'm in control. Awesome. Absolutely great. And that leads to micromanagement. And that leads to people quitting because they had to be micromanaged. And that leads to a reinforcement of the belief that they get control, which is what they value through doing it themselves. They believe they get respect from a hard work ethic. They don't believe they get respect. Some people don't, well, at the start, they don't believe they get respected for having a jet. But they fantasize about it, but they don't actually get it. This is the difference. There's a lot of fantasizing happening here that is not actually a goal because action is not taken. So a self-employed person is in there going, okay, I believe I get respect through hard work and diligence and uh, expertise in my field, typically as a technician, because this stuff is general, this is generational. Your identity is created by the generation before that was created by the generation before that. So I did, we're still all bouncing around with the identity, mainly of the industrial age, where if you didn't have a job working in a factory, working for the man that you did not respect, then, you know, you, you had to sell shit door to door. Ow. Encyclopedias and boot brushes and those reprehensible <coughs> salespeople. And the man up on the mezzanine floor in the suit, you didn't respect him because you couldn't get there. You may remember, guys, Aesop's fables and the, 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 the fable of the sour grapes, the fox and the sour grapes. Cut a long fable short, fox wants grapes, fox can't get grapes. Fox gives up going, oh, they'd be sour anyway. Who'd want them? Not wanting something that we wanted through inability to get it is, is a convenient way to protect our ego. So they believe they get control through doing it themselves. They believe they get respect through um, hard work ethic and being one of the boys. So, but that's that particular person's the identity created this reconciliation between beliefs and values. So how about Richard Branson? Richard Branson. Does Richard Branson believe he gets control through hard work? No. His identity has created a, a belief that he gets value through empowering and enabling other people and influencing other people so that they aspire to do what they do. He didn't believe doing it himself gets control. He believes other people, he gets control through getting other people to do it that are better than him. He believes he gets respected by building a huge organization, having a bunch of people that are, that are happy, <coughs> excuse me, con contributing to a community. So can you see how there's, there's this gap or there's this conflict almost between the bottom of the iceberg and the top, between beliefs and values? Now, there is a tool, well, again, these tools get more complex and quite difficult. There is a tool to adjust values, and these are just my mental musings and philosophies. And I believe that is perspective. Perspective. If I want to change your perspective, well, great. I'll, I'll send you down in the middle of Brazil somewhere and, and you can do some missionary work for a couple of years. 
Or if that's all you're doing, missionary work and busy being very altruistic and, and philanthropic instead of fitting your own oxygen mask before assisting others, then I might send you to stay for a week at Raffles in Singapore or somewhere beautiful. But changing perspective, immersing in the environment where you go, huh, this is actually quite fun. Now, action gives you a great alternative perspective to whatever you did previously in life. Because we will all support your dreams and goals and aspirations. We love the idea. Bruiser, my great mate, Bruiser, you rang me yesterday afternoon saying he was so excited because he put down a deposit on a Maserati Gran Turismo. Now, I was so happy mainly because I just settled on my F-type Jaguar that's faster than his. So, but other than that, <laughs> by at least a second and a half. But look, to be honest, other than we, we love, we love having, we love having fun together. And I love that he can build this incredible home that he's built. And I love seeing him, you know, be able to, to get these, these things. And I will tell you what, when you turn up as your B, clients will come to you. Okay, you, you've got two forms of, of influence. One is aspirational and one is manipulative. So a manipulative influence, manipulative influence. Oh, look at all that note taking. You like that, do you? Okay, so manipulative influence, anything that manipulates, it's a valid influence. If a, if a company, if a business has a sale, that's a manipulation. If you offer a team a reward or a bonus or an incentive program, that's a manipulation. If you have two for the price of one, that's a manipulation. They're all valid. But the challenge is if you take the manipulations away, there is no retained loyalty. The aspirational influence, the aspirational leadership. No, I'm good. I'll wait the extra five minutes. <laughs> you did make me think. <laughs> um, aspirational leadership. Is it, now you see my Raz. That's that's aspiration for you. Is that they want to be coached by you? I made two sales last week. I went to a BNI meeting. What the hell? I haven't done that for like networking for twenty four years. But only because it's in the pub across the car park at four thirty on a Wednesday afternoon. That I can do. Um, but we haven't even made the group yet. And, and I, I think we've got 10 semi-members so far and five have come up going, we need to sit down and talk. Two have become um, coaching clients. And one that became a coaching client, a little guy, he's doing 60 grand a year revenue as a web design company. Dad has been a leadership coach for 10, 15 years and mum is a startup business coach. Jeez, I'll be down very soon. This supper should be over within 15 minutes. Okay, yeah. thanks. Jeez, that's harsh. Okay, so. Can I hear you, Reggie? Yeah, keep, keep talking. Act like I'm not here. <laughs> it's, just, it's just distracting. <laughs> 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 I want Oh, really? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> so I said to this kid, you, you, your mum and dad are both business coaches. One's a business coach, one's a leadership coach. What are you talking to me for? And he said, well, you've got it together. You just, irrespective of the really, you know, coolest bike in the world and a funky office and, and just, you just, you seem to have it together. It's much easier to sell if you be the coach because you can exude and people then aspire. Then you get the referrals. You don't get referrals if you're like a business doctor that's wanting referrals from the sick and dying weak and, uh, and that sort of stuff. But that is for another conversation. So this is the idea. This is your battle. So I want you to reflect on your beliefs what you have now is what you have. Everybody rises to their level of acceptance. 
If you think you're going to do better than you're doing now without changing this, how this reconciles, you are delusional unless you're like one month into action. Those guys that have been in a couple of years or a few years, well, well I, I don't wonder what you're waiting for. I know what you're waiting for. I know you're waiting for this catalyst between beliefs and values. The mindset where, because to be honest, if I did less than probably 40, 45 grand a month, the world would end. It wouldn't actually end. I don't need it, but it would, it would be, I want you to get to a level where a, a particular billing that's above where you're at now is simply incomprehensible. You have one now. Maybe for some of you, it's incomprehensible to have a zero month. Maybe for some of you, you're sort of floating around here, but it's incomprehensible to have a 10 grand month. That needs to start climbing. Everybody, and you've seen it in this COVID problem, people are too close to the trailing edge of the treadmill. They're on the treadmill, that's okay, but they, they, they move a little bit, but this, they're, they're really close to the trailing edge and one little hiccup, you're off against the gym wall, splatter to the tiles. So this takes work, it is not something, it's not, it's, it's unlikely, it's really unlikely that you can actually do it yourself because you can't see your own bald spot. Somebody needs it. You can't hold yourself self accountable <laughs> enough even to do what you need to do. You can't have somebody that's unre you need somebody that's unreasonable, unreasonable enough to call your bullshit between about how your beliefs and values are being reconciled can't coach yourself because there's always that, even at this level, there's always that point where your self-discipline fails and it's short of what you need to have the breakthrough. So also the other reason that free coaching doesn't work, for those of you that are doing pro bono coaching, stop giving them placebo. If they don't have any skin in the game, they're not gonna take it seriously. If you want to do that, charge them a thousand bucks a month and after 12 months, give them a $12,000 check back. If they perform, but there's too much of a safety net if it's free. We've, we've known this for a quarter of a century. Now with your reflections, with your, there was some, uh, hands up if you've got a dream chart. Have I got a dream chart? Okay, nice. Bunch of funky stuff, cool stuff on the dream chart, I would imagine. I want you to go, here's an idea. Go and make a new dream chart. Fill it. But you can only put on your dream chart what is in your life that you own right now. So this is like your reality chart. I want you to build a reality chart. So take a picture of your current vehicle. Take a picture of your current home. Take a picture of your current uh, boat or your current uh, kids or... Because <laughs> <laughs> they might change. <laughs> then what you can do, if you can imagine that on, on a dream chart, then you can work on replacing it. You can look at the current situation and go, okay, well, that is my current level of acceptance. Irrespective of all the bullshit I tell myself, because I'll tell you what, when you're up in the morning on the balcony going, oh, I'm a billionaire and doing your affirmations, stupid standing over your shoulder going, you're a wanker. <laughs> if, if, you, if you stretch, if you have fantasies instead of goals, and what I mean by fantasy is something you found, oh, I want to own a castle in France and blah, blah, blah. But you're, you haven't sat down and gone, here are the steps to achieve it. Well, it's just a fantasy. Not even a dream or a vision or a plan. It's just, and, and we love everybody, most people in the world are loving living in fantasy. Everybody that puts in a lottery ticket loves the fantasy because the lotto ticket just makes them go home and lie in bed and dream about what life's going to be like when they win the $50 million. But actually, there's no other way to actually get it. 
and the chances of that are pretty slim. But they'll they'll pay that they'll pay that money for the thrill of the dopamine injection into their body. Now people talk about dopamine being the drug of uh, the, the, the drug of pleasure. It's actually not. It's actually the drug of anticipation. Dopamine is released in anticipation of your amygdala kicking in adrenaline. So dopamine is released when you are on the poker machines. Dopamine is released when you're thinking about doing road rage. Dopamine is released in those times that you get, you're thrilled with, you're about to have to take action. When you actually take action, the dopamine goes and other pleasure centers kick in. That's why people on the poker machines, they love the thrill of pushing the button and waiting for the, the wheels to stop. But if they win anything, it's just like, huh, okay, ooh, okay, I've got a bit of money back. Ooh, now back to the back to the wheel pushing. Because the actual pleasure centers are far less powerful than the anticipation centers. Again, beyond the scope of today's talk. So I suggest that you do a uh, what do I call it? A reality chart. And then work out, okay, what picture am I going to stick over that picture? I currently have a six-year-old Ford or a, a five-year-old BMW. What do I want to replace that with? That I want to replace with a Maserati or a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or whatever it is. This, this picture of my kid being a pain in the ass to his siblings, I want to replace that with my daughter in a wedding gown. I want to picture the, the office that I've got with a beach and a flip chart. I want to replace sitting in front of somebody at global conference with, with, with having fun with us at, at Emerald Diamond lunch, working out where the conference after next is going to be. So that gives you a little bit better of the push because you've got contrast. It says, okay, now I, I, I acknowledge the gap instead of just living the fantasy. And when you find somebody, when you have somebody, for heaven's sake, well, well no, it, it's up to you. My mantra when I was poor, when I was growing up, was do the best you can do every day and one day someone will see you. Now, that's a cool mantra. I don't know exactly where I got it from. Maybe it was from dad. Maybe it was from a book or something. It's a cool mantra. But it's not exactly empowering for entrepreneurs, is it? Do the best you can do every day and then one day someone will offer you a better job. Well, yeah, that's okay. And that's why I changed it, I don't know, maybe a decade ago to be I only ever take advice and criticism from people I aspire to be like. I only take advice and criticism from people I aspire to be like. You'll find out there in the world, because there's not just action coaches, of course, there's billions of coaches and billions of experts willing to offer you um, help and assistance and mindset work and, hey, here's how to get your click funnel working and blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, if you can show us what's in your bank account, if you've got a, a, an adoring relationship with your first wife, that's still your current wife after 25 years, if your kids are amazing, then more amazing than mine, then I'm happy to take advice off you. Why don't come tell me? Because you, if you had somebody, if you wanted a guide to guide you up Mount Everest, would you want somebody that read plenty of books about it and had some good theories or somebody that had actually been there? At an entry level, this is easy. You don't. You can fake it till you make it at this level and this level. This is easy. This is fine. Anyone can do that. Three-year-old can do that. But why do you do it that way? But <laughs> once you get once once you get beyond those levels, it's like soccer. I, I taught my kids, you know, under ten soccer, football. But I'm not going to assume that I could get in and teach the Olympic soccer team how to do soccer there's a level where you, you need to be, your coach needs to be the person you want to become. Until then, they can tell you what to do, even though they don't particularly do it. So 
there's a thought. Any questions? We're, we're sort of finished up. I don't want to keep you from uh, beer o'clock. It's a little while. The only upside of being tomorrow, or, or the only downside to not being able to have a beer with you guys is the fact that it's tomorrow. Um, but it's, it's uh, 8 a.m. It's probably a bit early for a beer, 6 to 7 uh, in the morning. Um, so any questions before we finish up on what I've covered? Questions, ideas, thoughts, feedbacks, comments? Jason Berry's taken off and left the fire going. Look at Jason. He's going to catch hold. Someone's got to have a question. I'm not going until someone asks a question. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, you stuck your head in frame. What's your bloody question? My bloody question? Yeah. When did you get those cool glasses? <laughs> About two weeks ago, you like them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the better glasses are the ones with the eyes open painted on them so you can nap during conference. <laughs> One of the conferences, we're actually tempted to get a couple of uh, couple of hundred pairs and we could all wear them at conference when Brad was talking. Any other questions? So who's gonna do a, uh, who's gonna do a reality chart? I'll step up, Steve. Yes, Jason. What are some of your uh, ideas on effective ways we can gain perspective that might not be obvious? I'm interested. Look, perspective is go go volunteer at a soup kitchen. Go volunteer at a homeless shelter. Um, that would be a couple of the, the, the stuff that is close. There's stuff that's close by that doesn't have to be really exotic or difficult. I mean, working out working out what your perspective is. I mean, that gives you a whole new level of, of gratitude. Uh, I would imagine. Um, go and talk to your parents if they're still around or, or your grandparents if they're still around. Um, you know, it's, it's too late when they're not. You know, my, my poor old mum, she was 92, but she died oh, maybe six weeks ago now. And she's in a different state. She's in Perth. So I couldn't get there to say goodbye and I couldn't go to a funeral. You know, goodbye on the phone is not quite the same. You know, and watching the funeral on TV is like something with a pretty shitty plot to it, um, not very exciting. So take the time to reach out to the people that have known you, get a perspective. Go and visit some of your clients. Go and visit wealthy clients. Go hang out with wealthy people. Pay money and go to a, a, a red carpet event or a black tie function. Last time I was in Salt Lake City, I think last year, I went and had a had a quick lunch with uh, with one of the partners and a client and a billionaires. She's worth almost three billion dollars. I was like, wow, that was a different perspective. Pretty chill, not going to bully me, not ostentatious, not something you despise. So that will be an idea. Great question, thanks, Jason. Yeah, Steve. Yes, Rick. Next question. What would be your first two questions to Richard Branson? Well, I was supposed to ask you the questions, Rick. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Um, have you got any old planes that aren't flying that you're not using that you could give me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a good, I, I will actually have to think on that, on that, Rick. Well, if you asked about the perspective and you went to the negative, and I was interested in what you would be asking for the perspective to bump you up, the person that you aspire to be. Um, look, I, yeah, I, I would probably ask for some more detail on, on some of the stuff that he did in his, you know, losing my virginity book and stuff that I've read. So, yeah, it, that's a good point. I would probably, once we sat down and, and I'd go, oh, it's Richard. 
what is what is next for him? You know, how, how does he how does he keep it? How does he really keep it interesting? How does he engage others? What are what are the two tips he has for more aspirational leadership? How does he? Yeah, that would probably be a big one. How does he inspire people to follow him? Because you know, theoretically, in a way, he has very few credentials. Anybody that's read his book, it's like you, this is not something that was written in your stars. Um, yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yes, I'm coming. Hi, Steve. Hello. I'm Brianne Salcedo. I am a one-year coach out of Houston, Texas, or just south of Houston, Texas. Nice to meet you. So my question is, where do I have to be to get Steve Leach as my coach? Well, you just have to talk to me. <laughs> what was the answer? I'm sorry. You just have to. You just have to talk to me. Okay. We'll set up a call and talk to me because look, at the end of the day, I'm I'm building a home at the moment. We've spent year and a half planning it and, and well over a hundred grand and it's not even out of the ground yet because the foundations are being built. A building is built on steel and concrete. That's the foundation and how well you build your foundation defines what you can build in the future, whether it be interim or whether it be the ultimate picture. So it's, I, I think it's great that you're fresh brains and a newbie. That's beautiful because you don't need to be untaught a bunch of stuff that you may have gotten. Um, so yeah, look, I'm, I'm, it, whether you do anything or not, I'm happy to have a chat with anybody in the action community. I think people don't reach out because they're intimidated. Same reason that people don't ring Brad and go, Hey, what should I have for lunch? Um, I'm not that scary, but I'm, I'm ha absolutely happy to contribute. So I'm happy to set up a time and we'll have a chat and I'll look at what you're doing and give you some ideas at the very least. Thank you. I appreciate that. I look forward to it. I'll email you tonight. Okay, lovely, perfect. That's a funny little sort of confessional thing, isn't it? That little hot seat chair there. <laughs> yes, I'm back, baby. <laughs> yes, my son. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, Leachy, for I have sinned. <laughs> and straight. <laughs> I, all right, so give some distinctions around something we're hearing a lot. Pick up the phone pick up the phone. So what are some distinctions around the people that you're coaching that maybe have had more of a social approach to marketing in the past? And now it's time to pick up the phone because a lot of those avenues are shut down, closed, uh, it closed down or limited. So need some distinctions around what's making pick up the phone effective. Sure, mate. Okay. So many layers to the ADD, anti-dialing disorder. No, nobody sort of likes it. Um, I've, I've tried a lot of different ways over the past. Um, so a couple of really simple behavior things. Um, if you need to do some, some calling of people that you haven't spoken to, one first call, ring a friend. Ring a friend, ring your wife, ring your kids, ring somebody that you love talking to. Second, so maybe two calls, ring buddies then do two calls ringing prospects or clients or something like that. So, so you've got a couple of calls where maybe they're not clients or maybe they're good prospects. We can have a good chat. Then do five cold calls. So, so you've had a very immediate, quick, oh, I picked up the phone. Oh man, that guy was so happy to talk to me. We had a really good chat. Pick up the second one. Hey, great. So, so you're on a roll before you start introducing the sort of let's face it, slightly more distasteful calls that you may need to make following up. Um, that would be number one. Um, I try and use a real phone because there's something about this thing that my brain doesn't acknowledge as a phone. I actually got an old Bakelite handset in a, a few years back and hooked it into the phone so I could actually pick up a phone and use it like a phone. And that ended up being much easier just because it was a visceral well, this is, I was okay picking up with the phone as a kid, but uh, now I want to sort of avoid it. So one is how you do it, when you do it, um, have a limited time to do it. So to just go, I'm going to make 10 calls and then I'm going to walk around the building or five dials and then I'm going to walk around the building. Um, stop. 
it's diff- it, the biggest thing, to be honest, Reggie, comes down to, again, what's between your ears. Are you a business gymnasium or are you a business hospital? If you're ambulance chasing and you're inclined to be saying, hey, blah, 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 it's me, hey, you know, and the whole, the whole genre or projection is, you know, hey, if you're working too hard, I can fix it. If you're working too long, I can fix it. If you need to make more profits, I can, I can help you with that. Um, there are a lot of words that I take my coach clients through that we eliminate. Help is one word that you should never use because you neither want to accept help or ask for help. So you have a visceral reaction. Hey, Reggie, can I help you? No, way. I'm, I'm right. I'm going to pop a hernia getting this rock into the back of my pickup, but no, 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 I don't want to worry. And then we wonder why, hey, I can help you grow your business. No, thanks. We're, we're right. No, we're good. It's like, yeah, I know that. That's why I wanted to help. So instead of help, if you go to a networking event, let's say, hi, what do you do? We help people grow their business. What do you do? I work with people to grow their business. But how about this? Hey, Reggie, I'd actually like to work for you. Would you let me work for you in your business? Would you consider allowing me to work for you? Now you're feeling good because now you're an employer. Now you get to interview somebody. Well, what do you think you do, Leach? Well, I'd love to work for you as your coach. Huh. Now the whole, this is where, what you project, your projection creates their objection. So listen to what they're saying. Think about how you would respond to that. You know, hey, you know, here I am. Avoid the things on the phone that tell them you are a seller. If I'm ringing up to buy something from you, I don't ring up and go, hey, how are you doing? It's Steve Leach from Action Coach. I ring up and go, oh, good day, mate. Look, I'm, I'm after a new surfboard. Can you fill me in a bit on what you're doing? Now, so if you, the moment you mention your name and your company, seller, and they'll have that stimulus response of no thanks, just browsing, that type of stimulus response of no, we're good. Um, I've developed a lot of scripts because stupid Steve hates picking up the phone, despises it, it's horrible. Um, but I do it. Luckily, I've built the practice I don't have to do it because I've worked out how to get the referrals. You don't get referrals if you're a hospital, you do if you're a gym. Um, but at the end of the day, picking up the phone and projecting, hey, look, I'm ringing you because I've been having a Google around. You are, as far as I can see, you are the best restaurant in Brisbane. Right? Would you consider letting me work for you? That's going to start a conversation, isn't it? And that's all you need to do. You just got to get past that first five second barrier to, to, to conversation. So it's a great question. Um, but there are guys that I would go through with that. There's lots of different, there's tactics, there's strategies, there's, there's mindset. Ringing up and doing surveys are a good way to get stupid to do it. So it takes, it distracts, it takes away the intention of asking for the sale. Because if you think about it mindset wise, if you weren't worried about having to ask for the sale, you'd have no trouble ringing people. No trouble at all. That's why it's easy for you to fill a room full of people for Brad Sugars doing a seminar than it is to fill a room full for you. It's great to sell for somebody else. And maybe you should swap that. Maybe you should, you know, do cold calling for a partner. There you go, partner up. So Reggie do Rick, Rick do Reggie. You know, that's great to go, hey, look, you know, I'm ringing up on behalf of Reggie. He told me to ring you because he thinks you're awesome and, and would like to talk to you about your business. I used to do that and put on an Indian accent, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I have a friend. I have a friend. You may need to be coaching here shortly. So, yeah, <laughs> ring for a friend. All right. <laughs> okay, guys. Great questions. But there is look. All, all, uh, thanks, Reggie. I, I want you guys to enjoy this of any profession and role and career on the planet. This one is, is above, this has no glass ceiling other than the one between your ears. All right, Steve. All right, mate. Any questions? Mr. Leach, on behalf of Hilton Head 2020, thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome. Have a great Sunday, and we will see you soon, my friend. Thanks, buddy. Look, as soon as I can get back on a plane, I'm maybe February. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. It's been great to see you guys. Bye.
Thanks, Steve.